Okay, so in 2005, I walked to the magnetic North Pole. Unfortunately, in 2013, I had a car crash, which caused a, I thought just a stroke, but actually it was a brain injury as well, as we got through it a little bit further. So I do, I'm aware of how devastating an impact on your life it can have. But anyway, today I'm just going to talk about the magnetic North Pole. So what, why the magnetic North Pole? Well, I don't actually have an answer really. It was just, I knew that I had to do something different that I, than I had been doing before. And um, I'd never really done anything physical at all. And I mean, I, yeah, if there was, there were picking school teams for football, I would always be the last person, things like that. So I thought, you know, thinking about it, I thought I had to be physical. And then I thought, well, I could do the round the world yacht race, but that's far, far, far too long. Um, I could climb Mount Everest, but to climb Mount Everest, you've got to know how to climb and, you know, it's it's dangerous. And then I was booked on a leadership course from, um, from work, which actually as a course wasn't that good, but it did solve what I should do. The people who were on it were speaking about in the first half spoke about them being around the world yacht race and they'd done this and they'd done that and I thought yeah I know but they're in the army they've got all the time you know there's no problem having the time off and then they spoke about a race that they'd just finished and they finished the first and as it happened I then went on the second and it took three weeks of racing to get there and um plus a week or so of climatization and a week going back, but they're only away from the UK for five weeks. And I thought, that, that, that can work. I can make that fit in around the, work, around the work issue and I can do it. So I thought, yeah, okay. And, and what they did is they'd race to the magnetic North Pole, which is why I then subsequently did it. Um, I still had the problem. I had no fitness. I'd never been anywhere near fit. I had no strength. And I had no body weight. I was the same sort of stature as, as I am now. But they gave me uh, Jock Wishart, who was the guy who organised it, his number. And uh, on the phone to him, I was sort of very nervous and kept explaining all these things. And he was just, no, if you want to go, we can get you there. If you want to go, you know, you may have to want to go a lot, but we can get you there. So I went to an assessment with him and... Um, I sort of went there and the physical side was was tough but it's, it's doable because it's just you know, just got to be constantly on your guard really and, uh, and then they started asking me questions from the interview and it pretty much came down to how big is your bank account and um, I managed to get through fortunately so that's that's why the magnetic north pole I then had 18 months or so to get ready. And the big shock to me, this section here in the middle, um, that's, that's a local, that's a dentist in Southampton who I was with. And um, one of the, one of the um, training sessions that I was at, they said, uh, if you've had any, got any old fillings, then you, you're just going to have to get them sorted out because they they could freeze up and trust me if you freeze up in your mouth then that's it you're off the race completely it's there's no issue about it at all and you know that's just how it is and I wasn't really that worried about it because he said it's so nonchalantly really but then uh, going home I was getting more and more worried and I just had to say well I'm gonna to have to get a dentist and uh He's just going to have to sort them out because I had four old fillings and that, that's just how it is. This bit here in the corner was a um, session in South Wales, actually, and it was relatively early on, but we actually stayed overnight there well, one night in a, um, yeah, in, the, in a tent. And it came as a real surprise to us just exactly how warm these tents were but we actually had snow there that day which was quite well so it's quite incredible but listening to what you said earlier on it's probably not but uh, they had had snow actually on the campsite and during the night we stayed over and I was in an ordinary sleeping bag and it was perfectly okay but 
Charlie, who was on our team, has got his got his North Pole uh, an Arctic sleeping bag, and he actually had to take it off during the night because it was too hot, and it just kept sweating up, and it was the only thing he could do was just to take it off. We had to had to shoot, unfortunately, because because there were polar bears. Now we obviously shot up in the air so that we'd scare the polar bear off as much as possible. And, you know, we just then, we'd just deal with it really. But the idea was just to shoot it up in the air so that the polar bear ran away rather than anything else. Unfortunately, there was one team who actually had to shoot a polar bear because they, they woke up in the night with it clawing at the tent. Um, to this day, I don't know who actually shot it, but I mean, it was, was horrible. And they, they rang up the organizers to tell them that they'd done it because, because you had to. And the organizer said, well, was it a male or a female? How do they know? I mean, the last thing they do is know what to start looking at it and work out what sort of sex it is. And they said, well, okay, how big is it? I said, well, it's similar to my height. So it's about five foot, maybe a bit more. And they said, well, probably it's a female, in which case, don't worry about it. You can just carry on and um, you can just carry on, go in the morning, go away in the morning and we'll come and fetch it and it will all be OK. But there's a possibility that it's actually an adolescent male, in which case mummy and possibly daddy are looking for it at the moment. So we suggest that you get out of the, there, get five miles away because that's how long their, their scent carries. And... Uh, we suggest you go as fast as you can and as quickly as you can. Then in this corner here, I am, I was in charge of all the day bags and uh, what happened, we had, a, we had breakfast of sort of some sort of porridge but that we cook and we have an evening meal predominantly of, you know, it was some various, some various things my favourite was meat and potato, but uh, we had an evening meal. But then during the day, we were, of course, travelling all the time. So you'd have a bag of basically sweets, um, biscuits. You know, I've got Nutri-Grain there, but anything really that um, just sort of just gives you enough energy as you carry on. Now, I agreed to do this because... I don't, I'm not sure quite how I got involved in doing it, but I agreed to do it for our team. And this is before it's all started. And at the, everything was where it should be. And then the idea is you have it there and it's unsorted elements. I'd weigh it up and I was meticulous, probably too meticulous, but I was meticulous at the point of making exactly, it was a kilo, and I knew exactly how much of each thing would be in, be in it. And... Um, then over here eventually would come the sorted bags. I don't know why she did this, and um, but I had a girlfriend at the time who from all the unsorted bags over here, which weren't a problem, she could take as many of this unsorted as she liked. Um, then, but for some reason she'd come in and she took for four or five sweets out of a sorted bag. And I was absolutely, I was fuming. And I said, well, which, where, where did you, how, where, where have you taken them? Where did they come from? Oh, I don't know. Have you done it before? Um, uh, yes. So I had to basically re-weigh re everything for the sake of sort of three or four sweets in, in the bag. In reality, I probably didn't, but at the time I was so meticulous to it. I, I went through it in order and I just made sure that everything was, was dealt with pro properly. Clothing was it's an interesting thing and I need to get up a little bit from here but inside the inner clothing is nothing at all it's very very mundane I mean we had um, at least we had um, sort of thermal bottoms thermal tops and a sort of slightly more thermal top on our you know as we went along but it's on the outside it is something else now I need to just check with the screen. This here is, is the um, sort of resting coat. We went, wear this when we stopped. It was too hot, believe it or not. It's actually too hot to rest while 
to where why we're walking. Um, I mean, you can see that it's padded, but it's not hugely padded, but I mean, it is incredibly hot. In Scotland, I, and I, since I've had the stroke and the brain injury, I'm very cold. And one time I was particularly cold. I thought, I oh, know, I'll wear the, um, I'll wear the polar top, you know, because of that. That, that'll make me warm, there won't be any issue with it at all. I put it on and within five minutes I had to take it off again because it was just sweating and so hot. This here, it's a sort of all in one. Um, it's the, it's the, ar the archetypal bit really, it's sort of the all in one clothing and it's got pockets everywhere. Um, we'd use one of these would be for our day bags and then everything else we had we'll just sort of generally walk in that we need to keep on, on us and we wear this pretty much whenever we're walking not around we wear it a bit in the camp but not too much but it was really just for when we're walking because what it does is it stops the wind and it's incredibly light but it is it's to stop the wind now these were the gloves and this is a chain that sort of connects the two gloves together and trust me, you know, we'd, we'd wear them like sort of a four-year-old would wear his sort of have his mittens at, ha uh, at home, but very, very important that they were tied together. Um, and they're not, there's no real use for them apart from keeping your hands warm. I mean, you can't do anything with them because there's just one, you know, they are just that, but they do, they do keep your hands warm and that is really all that matters. These here are the boots. Now this is a size nine boot, but it looks as if it's sort of a size 15. It's incredible. And, um, and again, it's just a way of keeping, keeping your feet warm. But the, the great thing about these is <coughs> inside, inside of these, there is, you know, while we're walking, you, you wear them inside. But you can take this bit out, out of it, and that be, we, makes a fantastic pair of slippers for when you're in, in the tent. Um, but outside, you've got that beautiful covering as well. So, as I say, this is the sort of the external clothing, and then of course you'd have a, a hat or something. But the, the internal clothing was just common everyday stuff throughout the day, really. So it was. It was quite incredible the way they, they had the two two differences. When we were going there, we um, we flew to a hotel in Ottawa, and then we flew from Ottawa up to Iqaluit and Iqaluit to Resolute Bay. Now, when I was in the hotel in Ottawa, it was a day before we were starting the race. I thought I'll have a look at the weather forecast up at Resolute Bay and see see what it is. <coughs> Excuse me. But when I looked at the um, looked at the weather forecast, it had a kind of you know beautiful map of the entire country, but it only went as far north as a calibit. Now I don't know I don't know, know where a calibit was, but I thought okay, uh, you know we're not going to get anything more than that. And it wasn't until we flew out and I thought, oh we're stopping at a calibit. I have an idea. It's probably you know just a tiny stop to get to Resolute Bay. It's probably sort of just a sort of fairly, fairly nearly there but we we sort of we we flew out and it's, it was about two hours to get up to a can of it and then I, when i got to a can of it i realized it was another two hours I and mean, it was the same plane so roughly getting up to you know so the top to a can of it's probably two-thirds of the country and they just ignore the top third completely from in terms of weather forecasts and things like that, because there's just so few people there, and it's so obvious what it's going to be anyway that they just don't don't worry about it. But in a cal of it, it was I was quite nervous because you know the race was going to start, but I hadn't yet yet got got involved in it. And um, I stopped at the the airport, which I, I call it an airport, but it's actually a large shed. I mean, it was just just a big shed and they're waiting for people. And uh, there's nothing to do at all, but they've got pictures all round round the um, side of it on the wall. And 
I thought, well, you know, I, and I made sure that I had read every single picture because I had to do something. I just had to keep my mind occupied. Uh, that's where I saw these two pictures. And we'd all been told about polar bears and how frightening they are. And I knew that. But to actually see a picture that said someone could get killed or the hand that thieves could get eaten was really quite a shock to me. Um, and I particularly like that someone could get killed for some reason. But, uh, yeah, just thought, oh, that's this is a totally different thing to anything that I've been involved with before. Other threats that you needed to be aware of were sort of frostbite. And I did actually get frost, tiny bit of frostbite in these two fingers. Um, it wasn't enough to worry me. And it was certainly wasn't enough to me to be sort of pulled out of the race or anything like that. But it, it still made me think, you know, you've got to be careful here because I just, they just happened. I mean, I don't know quite what it was that caused it, but it just, it just happened. And, um, but one, one, the only person who got pulled out of the race, he actually throws, I think it was these two fingers together on the first leg. And um, they sort of separated the fingers for him. So these two, they separated his fingers from the end of the first leg, but said, look, whatever happens, make sure they do not freeze up again, because if they do, you're going to have to be off the race because it, it's going to get dangerous and you could lose a finger if you're not careful. Anyway, I arrived at the checkpoint for the second leg and he said, um, these are frozen up again and uh, they just pulled him straight off the race, which he was the only one of the 16 of us who, who was not allowed to complete the race, unfortunately, but that's... That's how it is. Before that, I'd, back at the airport, I'd arrived at sort of Heathrow and I arrived early because my then girlfriend was needed the car the full day and it was just, that was the only real time that she could get, she could deliver me, which was, was fine. Uh, but what amazed me was that there was already, there was already people there and they all looked the same as I did, which was their sort of, quite excited and ready to go, but equally very nervous about it and not really sure what was going to happen. During the flight, Jock told us all that we could put down that we had no food we, we, on the list, the sort of checklist. We, we could put down there was no food. We didn't have any food because we were part of a team. And blindly, I just said, well, OK, if that's what he says, I'll just do it. Uh, it wasn't until afterwards I thought actually that's quite dangerous that we were able to do that but fortunately we got away with what we wanted we got away with it and uh, we just carried on but uh, it was it was quite brave whilst we had a week acclimatizing there was no doubt that I was the weakest person of the of the whole race let alone in our team and um i knew that and everyone knew it of course uh yeah but so i thought well i've got to get something that enables me to just say look i'm doing what i can do and you know i know that you're going to be better at me taking more stuff and, and those sorts of things but the one thing i could do was cooking and the cooking whilst it doesn't seem doesn't seem that amazing the thing about the cooking is you had to get up a quarter of an hour or so earlier every morning and get things ready. And you had to, depending on when you went away during the night, you could potentially use another half a quarter of an hour sleep just getting things organized later on. So it, it actually became quite a big, big issue. But I could say, look, I'll do all the cooking if um, you're prepared to just accept that from time to time, you're gonna need to take more stuff. That's all, all there is to it. And um, <clears throat> the other two agreed, well, I say they agreed with this, but uh, they had no choice, but uh, they, they let me take on the, on the cooking. And that, as a result of that, I then became in charge of the, of the camp, sort of the fire side of it every night. And I, of course, although we're still at climatization here, I was, it made sense for me to have, get involved with all the cooking through this area as well. The first night that we slept outside and um, we were going to wake up and have breakfast 
and then just sort of go inside. And we were only about 50 yards from the campsite. So it was no real problem, but we were outside and we would wake up and get, get the cooking going. It was an absolute disaster. It's incredible, but the reason it was a disaster was that I had no idea about all of the things that needed to be planned beforehand. I just assumed that we could use come home and sort of turn on the electric cooker and just keep going. And uh, of course, it's not like that at all. So first of all, we needed to light the, the, um, light the fire. Well, we need matches. Well, I don't know, no idea where my matches were, but eventually I found, found them. Of course, it's, I was about minus 20 at the time. So the matches, we just couldn't get them lit. And eventually I managed to get one a light, but again, it took a long time. Then I needed one thing that the, being in the Arctic has taught me, and I still find amazing actually, is you can't, you can't melt snow. You can melt water that melts the snow, but you can't actually melt the snow itself. So I needed a little bit of water and you, admittedly you don't need very much water with it, but I needed to find a little bit of water to make sure that it got the sort of the, the beginning of it going. Fortunately, Alex, one of my teammates, hadn't had all of his drinking water and we were able to just pour, pour that little bit in. Um, but eventually I finally got it going. And uh, the other two were, by this point, were getting a bit impatient about it and you know, wanting to know where their breakfast was. And Alex sort of had a look around and he looked at the guards and he looked, looked at how I'd put the, um, the foil around the, around the heater so that it went up straight up and, and got going. And he realized that oh, I'd done all this, I hadn't actually got put any lids on the, the um, saucepan. And of course, you, back in the UK, you probably won't, but there you had to have the lids on. So eventually we were able to eat, uh, but it was, it was a complete, well, I'd say it was a complete disaster. It would have been a complete disaster if it happened in the race, but because it happened at the training, it was fine because I just knew that I had to get, make sure that I got prepared in the evening and Precious items like matches needed to be slept with. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The, you needed to have water or ice to melt the snow. And then what we used to do actually is we used to end up with about half the, we'd, we'd end up with about half the water left after we prepared all the meals and things. And I just left it and it, it would freeze and you'd get an item, you know, sort of about that much of ice on the top but that would soon that would soon melt and you just go carry on with water it you know carry on set uh, get a light and then you can pour some extra snow in but um the the sleeping bag was actually quite amazing how much stuff you used to have in it because i used to have anything that was metal in there so i'd have yeah you know, i'd have a sat nav i'd have the batteries i'd have a camera i'd have hmm? Uh, lighter. Um, I'd have bullets because you needed to make sure that you could get them quickly and they also needed to be able to, if you had to, you needed to have them sort of quite, you need to make sure that they fire. And it was incredible the amount of things that you'd have in a sleeping bag. But the biggest lesson we learned that night actually didn't come from my cooking, it came from Charlie. I don't know why, but I, I decided I'd sleep with, this, with the pee bag in the, in the bag again it was something that needed to go in the sleeping bag um but he decided that he'd put it in one of the um tent pockets and back by his side so it's about here in his tent pocket and he awoke to find a bottle full of frozen pea um fortunately we're near the base camp and he just gave it to the organizers and he managed to keep this a secret from us until the next night when the organizer came over to the tent and very loudly told charlie that he'd he managed to defrost his pea. I was very delighted with it. But uh, yeah, that was it. Now the weather, typically it would be minus, minus 25, there or thereabouts. We did have a thermometer we bought on the, um, yeah, we bought in Canada. And <clears throat> that went down to minus 40. There was one day on the first leg that it had frozen at minus 40 and that was it, it wasn't going to go any further uh, and we believe that day was probably minus 45, minus 50 but yeah, t 
typically it was minus 20, minus 25. Now we have one day, believe it or not, this is this is Alex in the snow, and there is there is a background to it, and it, there is something there. But it, that was it. That was a whiteout. That was on the first leg, and we just had to. We you know, by the time we sort of realised where things were, and um, who was what, we just said, All right, we're just going to put the tent up, and we're just going to stay there for a couple of hours, let this this whiteout disappear, and. Um, that's just just how it was really there's nothing else we could do about it um, typically it was sort of like this which was was you know fairly overcast but it was something that we could just keep going with and at least we could see where things were and how things were going and every so often you'd wake up and it would be like this which is a beautiful a beautiful day in terms you know as far as the Arctic is concerned and it was totally you know, dry and it was just you were able to get off and, and get going. This igloo here is something that um, you don't really think about it when you're racing but actually the checkpoint crew that were there had a really mind-numbingly boring job. I mean they'd get there before anyone else obviously and They'd, they'd wait and there's nothing else for them to do because it's the Arctic. I mean, it's they're in the snow. So they would they could guarantee that we would get there and we'd find an igloo and a few other things, but that would be the, the main the main thing. The terrain typically it was it was sea, it was frozen ice. I mean it's North Pole is on is is on is on the sea six months of the year it is frozen and not very light and pitch black then the other six months of the year it's it's sort of liquid and you've got about a month pretty much a month or so when you can go and expect to get there and um, which is exactly where we went it's about april and you took sort of then in the beginning of may it's starting to get dangerous and you need to need to come back but uh that would be typically the main bit is every so often you get items like this now this is sea ice it's just where it's the seas sort of tufted up it's tufted up and it's just frozen in an odd way and occasionally you get sort of fields of this um but normally it was just it's just a one or two bits so you just have to work your way around them and then every so often you get items like this which you can see from that bit there that, that you know it's it's going to be it's on land and as you say you've got sort of a bit of mountains and stuff and well not mountains but hills in the background one of the big things with the with north pole is is that uh, if you get a problem and you don't deal with it then it can seriously hurt people and even things that in the back in the uk you might get you know, it's not an issue, but there it can become a problem. So whenever a problem happened, you know, we would just sort of have a look around, so check that we're all okay. And as long as we're all okay, the trick is just say, well, thank you and just move on with it. Um, and we managed to do that all by once. And um, for summary, well, we had an argument and it was the one argument we had within the group to do with hot chocolate. Again, not a particularly, you know, something that is not a great deal of an issue back in the UK, but when you're out there, it, trust me, it's a big issue. And what had happened was before, when we went out there, we decided that we were going to have hot chocolate one evening, then coffee, then hot chocolate, then coffee, then hot chocolate. Um, during our climatization, we decided that actually we, we would have hot chocolate every day, which was was fine but the only problem is I bought enough for half and half maybe a little bit more but certainly not for the whole trip so I said well we're going to have to go into a Resolute Bay well you know they've got a shop here and hopefully they'll have some hot chocolate and we can just carry on on with it um, which we as we do which which we managed to do and we got handed this sort of tub of hot chocolate and which I took with great glee and that was that was it then 
Well, I hadn't realised the original hot chocolate had been sort of the Cabris version of it. And then this was the Canadian local version. And uh, but getting on towards the, the about halfway through the third leg, we ran out of, of the British hot chocolate. And I then just said, oh, I just carried on. No problem, I'll just start using the Canadian stuff. I actually, I didn't even think about it. I didn't even, I'd completely forgotten about the fact. But, uh, but I'd also decided that we're getting near the end of the race here now, and I know we've got enough hot chocolate. So I, I'll, I'll make sure that I'll, I hand everyone a little bit more because uh, yeah, we, we've got more now that we can have. Later that evening, Charlie, one of the team members, said, just didn't understand what I did. And it said, and the hot chocolate that evening tasted like water. And, I, and normally I would have just sort of said, you know, I'd have just laughed it off a little bit. But at that point, because I'd deliberately given more hot chocolate, I, I was fuming. And we managed to spend probably, probably a couple of hours just arguing about the hot chocolate. <laughs> And uh, because as far as I was concerned, they had more hot chocolate and we stopped because we fell asleep. There was no other reason that we just fell asleep. And the next day, Alex, when we got up, Alex came over to me and he said, um, did you change the brand of hot chocolate yesterday? And I just looked at him and I thought, yeah, that was it. And we just moved on. We just, <laughs> don't worry about that, we'll just move on. This is a picture, believe it or not, that is taken dead on midnight. And um, you can tell because it's the sun's coming down, but it isn't going, going under at all. And um, I wouldn't normally walk through the night at all because basically I couldn't, but there was one night that was we were reaching the end of the third checkpoint and we stopped for the evening meal about 10 miles from the checkpoint, which is about five hours of normal walking and it was beautiful it was a lovely day it was it was crisp and dry and it was you know that, that dead on midnight and it was it was fantastic so I decided well we decided that we'd walk on through the night this particular time and get to the checkpoint because then it didn't really matter how the, the clocks were going and um, this particular night as I say I just carried on walking and dead on midnight so it was this this was this sort of vision and it was just lovely. As I said, I'm I was far and away the weakest in the in the group, but I did realise that if we were going to win a leg, it would be the first leg. And the reason we would win this leg is because until then people didn't really know how much they were going, how hard they were going. So it was typically not how fast could you go on the ice, but how much time would you spend on, on the ice? And so we decided that we'd just get up early that particular day when, when the race is, you know, we're going to finish it during the next day. We'd get up early and we'd just go, go for it. So I, because I was the, you know, the cook in the tent, I decided I'd set up my, my watch for two o'clock. And I woke up at two o'clock in the morning. I then went to the back of the tent, but instead of cooking, I just threw up. I was really violently ill, and and I didn't know what I, where I was or what day of week it was or anything. But I knew that I couldn't get up just then. For some reason, I still don't know why this was, but I would wake up in the Arctic every hour and a half really just yep I'm here okay and I'd be back to sleep but I knew that I'd wake up and at 3 30 I knew I'd be awake so I decided that um, I'd get up at 3 30 because that would still give us enough time to win the leg win the race but it would make me feel a little bit better and it's just actually just prior to this where I, where I threw up because we were in the Arctic and it was so cold by the time it had landed it was already frozen solid. So it was from, <laughs> from, from a sort of a racist viewpoint, it was great because it was in the tent, but neither of the other people knew about it because it had already frozen solid as it landed, which 
it was a bit of a bonus really but anyway I said I, I knew that I'd wake up at 3 30 and I did I still don't know why but I woke up at 3 30 and I just had to get up and keep things going um that day I was particularly useless I mean there was one point where the other two people actually said do you just go on keep going in that way and they were actually assessing to see whether or not I'd had hypothermia or not. Uh, they decided that I probably did have, but it wasn't what they could do about it anyway. So they just keep an eye on me and just keep things going. But it did mean that we kept doing this. We arrived at about, about three in the afternoon. We arrived at checkpoint two and we had a look around and there was no one else there. We'd actually won the first leg, well, sorry, checkpoint one. We'd actually won the first leg. What I didn't realise was just how much, how close it would, had become because within half an hour, two other teams had arrived, but we were first, that's all that mattered. We finally managed to arrive at the North Pole. It was about three weeks when we, by the time we'd got there. Uh, unlike the true adventurers and explorers of the past, we didn't have to walk back. We were able to fly back. Uh, it took us about three weeks to get there and about three hours to return. And I sometimes wonder whether it would just be easier just to fly out there and sort of have a look at it and then fly back. But no, it's not the same. The important thing about this trip was about getting there. It was about the journey. Uh, so that's all I've got that I want to talk about today. As I say, I'll happily ask, answer any questions as people have got them. But that's all I've got to talk about at the moment. Oh, thank you, David. That's been really, really interesting. Um, and do, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask David? Can, that feel, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Yeah. On the screen still there. Um, it's just in relation, David, to the, the food that you got. Was there a list of, of nutrients and calories and things that you had to make sure? Um, no, I mean, the organisers were very, very good at organising everything. And there were, there were basically th the breakfast was a choice of pretty much two porridges, but that was literally what they would come from. And I'm fairly sure that they'd, they'd identified that there's enough in there. Then in the evening, in the evening meal, there would be, there was a choice of sort of seven or eight different things. But again, I'm sure that they, they had organised what was in there, but they did, certainly never told us. And then we were told the only bit that we could actually choose would be the, the day meals. And what we were told is basically you get it with as much sugar as possible because you're going to be burning through it as soon as possible, yeah, very quickly. Um, they basically said dried fruit, sweets, obviously, and then sort of biscuits and those sorts of things just to keep things going but yeah there was no there was no sort of organized trip meal uh, sort of, that I'm aware of anyway. Hello. 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 Um, um yeah thanks thanks Melanie. Um has anybody else got any more questions? Um I've got a rather embarrassing question. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, you told us how you wee, but you haven't told us how you poo. <laughs> uh, well, I'm amazed at to the second question, <laughs> actually. <laughs> That's amazing how often I'm asked that. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> the, as you say, the weeing side of it's actually fairly straightforward, particularly for, for the men, obviously. And it's a very good way of knowing how well you're doing, because how fit you are, because yeah, how hydrated you are. And as you get further into the race at each point, it gets sort of more dry. But the, the pooing side of it is just, you know, basically just go a little away from the tent, if assuming you're camping, but if you're walking along, it's just move away. And um, you just, just sort of squat down. You try and keep as far off the ground as, as much of the ground as possible. And that's it. And it's amazing how you, your pride amongst other people sort of disappears fairly quickly. 
first time you might be quite sort of looking at where where to go, but actually the second time is just keep it away so it's not it's not sort of affecting anyone and just just go there. I mean, the nice thing about it being the ice and particularly as it's on the when you're on the sea is that it is automatically all dealt with, so it just disappears eventually. But yeah, that's yeah. Just connected to that actually. When we were sort of yeah in the tent, in order for sort of daily washing, we allowed one wet wipe a day, um, which was and that was it to just sort of do the entire washing. So we'd have the face and and we'd have sort of the body and everything. But you literally that was all you could do. And the thing I think was the most disgusting thing about this was the fact that you had to take the wet wipes back. So you had to show at the end of the race, we had to actually show the organizers that, yeah, these are all the wet wipes and this is where they came from. And yeah, whilst it sort of annoyed us at the, at the time, it's actually very sensible and it got everything, yeah. We, the beautiful, you know, a place as beautiful as the Arctic, you do not want to um, <laughs> full of wet wipes and things like that. So it was, it was very sensible. You had to take everything back with you. but. Uh, there were a few times where people were sort of, well, can't we just forget that and pretend it's lost? But no, we had to just sort of get on and deal with it. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I think we're all probably thinking the same. Um, uh, it's amazing, actually. I, it's very rare that I go through an entire presentation and don't mention that at least once. Um, <laughs> but, well, yeah, it's if you think about it, it's actually... It's those things that are the more intriguing, really, is how do you just deal with the sort of the basic, the whole race is all about dealing with the basics of life. It's not about dealing with the complexities of it. So. I think Tim Peake says that, doesn't he? As an astronaut, that's the, only, that's the question he always gets asked. The well, same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The woman always wants to know. And uh, it's interesting, but it's normally the women who want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay because you don't have periods. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, out of um, all the, uh, the 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 trip, have you got um, any you know a tale that sticks out in particular, or something that happened that you know will stick with you? Yeah, I mean, I think the the midnight photo is possibly the sort of the most impressive sort of overall image, if you like, because it was something that was so totally against me to do because it was meant an extra night walking really, but uh, it was just so beautiful when it happened. And so that that's a particular high point. Um, I'm desperately trying to think. One of the other areas actually is before, before the race started, was again the first night, I'd, I'd left my, my hat inside the inside the tent and it was only 50 yards from the where we were at base camp so it was no real problem I just go and go and get it and then come back you know and that would be perfectly okay and that's I decided to go and there was a four or five year old Inuit in in, in the base camp just looking at me and was, what are you doing anyway I got out and I started going and of course, he didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Inuit, so there was no sort of conversation going. But the look of sheer horror on his face that I was going outside was quite amazing. But of course, he's a four-year-old, you know, and I'm a I'm a 34-year-old, there's a what I say six-year-old as I was then. And obviously, yeah, I'm far better at knowing what the weather's like than he is, even though he, he lives here and I don't. And I went to the tent. By the time I got to the tent, already my but my ears were both burning at the top i mean it was incredible and there was no way i should have been out but uh, i went and i think the the um sort of if i had any sort of arrogance any sort of stubbornness beforehand that was it it's gone then because it was oh, okay you know he knew what was going on i didn't so i fully respected him on that score You don't go out without your hat on. Yeah, you you go nowhere without your hat on. And that the thing actually that was quite amazing was that 
once you've got the well, if you had all of the clothes on it was actually reasonably warm but you had to make sure that you had were totally fully fully clothed and there was no so you couldn't leave a little bit of your nose there because that's you know, just didn't quite work you know we had to have on our goggles we had to have that bit there that was covered um actually with our goggles you know they were the normal bits we had that was fine but i, I this, you know, wear glasses i wore glasses at this point as well and um it was i couldn't see without them so i had to sort of had to go to a local opticians and just say look can you with these glasses can you make me a couple of pairs that have got sort of are protected against the snow against the glare from from the ice and i went to spec savers in winchester and they were incredibly helpful and they rang me up a couple of weeks later with these beautiful glasses and they've got this thin layer of sort of pink mauve sort of glare, glaze to them uh, which is quite incredible and now they they um the wrong prescription and i can't wear them but they still look wonderful <laughs> <laughs> So on the sleighs you were pulling, how much weight were you pulling on the sleighs? We had um, we had about two hundred and twenty kilograms between the three of us. So yeah. would be sort of typically sort of seventy five or so kilograms. I tended to be a little bit less than the other two. I probably pulled about fifty five, sixty, and they pulled a bit more. But uh, yeah, it would be that sort of sort of weight. And it got slightly less as you went on, which was wonderful. <laughs> oh. Anybody so, got any more questions? Yeah, but your brain injury, did that presumably happened after you got back? Yeah, I mean, I went to the North Pole in 2005 and then April the 27th, 2013, I had a car crash, which caused the brain injury. So, yeah, I mean, that was it was a, a wide gap. Had a stroke as well, but um, it was a wide gap. And interestingly enough, in the eight years or so that I got back, I was always, you know, I mean, I'd been to the North Pole, I always knew about it, but I never really worried that much about it because it was just another trip. When I got back after the stroke, and you thought, right, actually, this is it, I'm where I am now, it's amazing how much more important this has become. And, and it, yeah, it was just, uh, and the thing is, I can't, whereas before I could always, if I'd wanted to, I didn't, but if I wanted to, I could always say, well, I'll go and go to the South Pole, I'll try this, I'll try that. Um, whereas now, no, that's it, this is, <laughs> you went, but you couldn't go again. If it, so at the time, it was very, very, it was you know, very therapeutic for me to actually, actually having been there. Well, it's a fantastic experience, isn't it, that none, so few will have done and will be able to do in the future. So to be able to hear all about it is just brilliant. Thank you. Mm. Because it's totally off any things out any of our likely experience. So it's, you know, brilliant. Um, David, would, you, would, you, would you like to tell us a bit about your book? Your yeah. Books? Yeah. What I've did, done is since I, I had the stroke and the um, injury, really is something to do. I started writing a book. And the problem I had is that with the brain injury, of course, it wipes you out very, you know, you don't have any energy or anything. But writing, I was able to work sort of half an hour, an hour a day. And that, you know, it would kill me for the rest of the day. But at least it was done and it was something I could see what was happening. Uh, so I wrote a book called Polar Stroke, which is about first half of it is predominantly about the North Pole and about how I got there and about what happened. And then the second half is about what's happened since I had the stroke, about how, how it's sort of coping, coping with it. One of the things that was quite interesting, I've, I've got a, one of my wires is such that I tend to be about sort of four or five degrees a lot colder than, than I was before. Um, I was told Oh, well, you know, there's three parts of the body that will keep you warm. There's both the armpits and your crotch. And um, I thought, I know this. Why have I done that before? And eventually I realised it was because it was cold weather training. And it was, you know, there I learned it because, because it was cold weather. And here I learned it because I'm cold. But it fundamentally is the same. 
so it's about so the second bit is then how much these two overlap really uh, so yeah i wrote a book about that and <clears throat> mainly there's something to do but it's called polar stroke you'll see at the end there's a static picture of it and then because of that i realized that <clears throat> writing is actually good for me and it gives me something it keeps my brain occupied and whereas i was accountant before I can't do that and, and turn around to people and say, I'll have it done by Monday or Wednesday or whatever, because I just don't know. Whereas this, it's only me who's writing the book. So it just me who suffers if it takes longer than it used to. But I wrote a book again, this time a novel, but funnily enough about a stroke victim. And one of the nice things about the stroke, or well, the bad thing about the stroke is everything's bad. I mean, everything just keeps going. And uh, so I decided that I had to have something that would be better for him. So as part of his recovery process, he develops magical powers. And he, first of all, he starts using them against his neighbours who, I don't know about you, but I found it incredibly, I found it quite hurtful actually how some of the neighbours would sort of suddenly went against me because I had the stroke rather than anything else. But um he uses it against them, but eventually he realizes that's just a waste and he starts using it for good. And that's called a stroke of fortune. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you, David. Been uh, really, really interesting. I thank you for answering our questions as well. I just, while I'm on, one of the things with, with for questions is I've managed to answer most of them as, yeah. Normally I answered all the questions without any problem at all, but I had one question by, from a five-year-old that I was totally taken with. And uh, I've been, I was, I've been to North Bolton and the, the local group in Peebles, so that's where I was at the time, they had the local church group arrived and it was all about, basically all lower school kids. So from sort of five to, sort of 10 or 11 and uh, we were asking the question asking the questions and this little boy came up and he obviously quite quite nervous and he sort of he plucked up enough courage and he said did you see father christmas <laughs> uh, oh, what on earth do you say here now and um i was sort of looking around desperately trying to, for anyone to give me some idea and all the adults were going no, don't know not gonna help and Barry, who organised it, actually said, um, well, I know what David's going to, to answer, but I'll just let you hear it from him. I said, what if you know? Can you give me an answer? And uh, I, I don't know where it came from, but I suddenly thought, no. When I said to him, I said, well, we went in, uh, we went in springtime, and of course, Father Christmas is around in wintertime, so we were at the <laughs> wrong time of the year for us. But I, I saw looked at every adult, and, <laughs> breathing a great sigh of relief but uh, <laughs> yeah that's uh, that's just what you have to do unfortunately <laughs> great answer <laughs> oh wonderful well thank you um if there's no other questions then um where can people find information about your uh, where to get your book david um yeah the books on Amazon. So if you just search either Polar Stroke or A Stroke of Fortune by David Aston, it takes you to you to them. Um, Polar Stroke is £15. It's quite a big thing. And then Stroke of Fortune is £7.50. Uh, there is, when we get there, a static photo at the end of the Polar Stroke, which gives you a little bit more information. But uh, yeah, Polar Stroke or Stroke of Fortune by David Aston on Amazon. Oh, great. Thank you. Wow. That, that does look cold. <laughs> yeah. That, he was incredible, actually. This guy, he, they, um, they didn't win it, although they should have done, but they were just too laid back to start with. But he'd come in and we'd be, how on earth did he manage to get so cold? Because, I mean, every, you know, all the way through, I'd make sure I had enough of everything on so that it was on my face and things like that. And he'd, he'd just sort of arrive as if, He'd been out, you know, for the night or something, and it was—I don't know what he did to 
that got so much water and so much close to him. But no, he was quite incredible. And the speeds which he and his there were two doctors and the speed that they crossed, they covered the ice was quite incredible. But uh, unfortunately, as I say, they were, they were laid back a little bit too laid back on the first two legs and they didn't um, weren't able to catch it up at the end. That you? That's me. Yep. At, uh, that's um, the third checkpoint, I think. And this is uh, pretty much every photo of once we get onto the second leg and onwards, I'm totally blown away and totally, totally knackered. But um, <laughs> just the way it is. <laughs> So how long ago was it? Um, April 2005, so that's... Um, 15, 16 years 16 almost, years, yeah. yeah. Just over 16 years yeah. now, yeah. Yeah, they're great photos. Yeah, I mean, it's... The camera was quite incredible, actually, because... Mm. I, I didn't have a camera at the time, so I thought, well, I'll buy one for the pole. And we got sort of, we, we asked him, you know, what, we asked Jock, we said, well, when you buy your camera, you know, what, what do you ask for? And he said, um, well, it's important that the battery is chargeable away from the phone because what you're going to have to do is you'll get the battery charged up while you're, you know, one battery charged up while you're on the leg and then we'll sort them over and carry on. But if you've got to, Put the whole camera there it won't work so okay that makes sense you want to have a screen on it because you don't want to have to constantly be putting it up to your eye and making sure that what what's happening you just need to have a screen and see how things are and you need to make sure that it's plastic because if it's metal it'll freeze and you, you know you'll you'll get cold i thought okay that's good so i went with those three things to um the local camera shop in winchester at the time and uh I don't blame him because it's not something he's asked that often. But first of all, he said, well, what about, about this camera? And you could see that first thing, it was fairly obvious you had to plug the whole camera into the, into charge it up. So I said, well, that's not going to work. I said, what about this one? And he said, um, I said, well, yeah, that's metal. And I don't want metal because it will sort of freeze to it. And uh, eventually, he had one camera in the shop and he said, well, what about this one? I said, yeah, that, that'll work. And uh, as I say, it was quite bizarre. That I was didn't care less about how many pixels it was, how good a photo it was, how, uh, you know, how quick it was or anything like that. Why should these extra bits? But uh, eventually I chose that one and for as long as it lasted, it was fantastic. And um, I'd have it back in, in the UK and, it was amazing how many people sort of, wow, that's a really good camera. Uh, but it was bought for totally non-camera items. But that's, how, again, how it is. Mm. Yeah, anyway, it's very interesting. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to go in a sec, but thank yeah. you so much. Okay. I found that really, really interesting. And I will tell, I mean, I my, I'm work for Headway and I live down in Devon. I will definitely recommend it to some of the groups to, to give you a shout. And hopefully we can uh, get you to come and speak again, because that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Headway, Devon, I haven't done. Um, I've got down to South Buckinghamshire, but uh, not any further with it. So, you know. oh, no. so we'll, we'll get you down past Bristol if we can. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, no, that'll be good. That'll be good. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, David. Right. See you oh, also. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yep, that's yeah. it. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much, David. That's been wonderful. Really right. interesting. So, uh, yeah, screen? thank you very much. And we'll re recommend your your talk Definitely. to others yeah, yeah. fantastic now is... yeah. cheerio everybody okay. bye thank you bye. thank bye. you very much thank you thank bye 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 yep I, i'm gonna go as well because i'm now falling asleep so oh so... oh thank you david it's been wonderful okay. i thank you for answering all the questions as well no i i it's funny but actually i enjoy the question a bit more than the uh do the 
the <laughs> basic talk because it's so uh, different you don't know quite what's going to come up so yeah I, that's always the better bit for me yeah oh thank you it's been really great